going to move on to the next lecture, which will be uh, delivered by uh, Professor Stephen Quake from Stanford uh, University. And his talk title will be uh, Precision Measurement in Biology. Thanks so much for having me here. Can you guys hear me with that? Is that all right? Yeah. So on the plane over here, actually, I was watching a Chinese movie. Uh, <clears throat> you want to talk about the intersection between traditional Chinese medicine and point of care diagnostics. And the plot of this movie involved a love triangle where uh, <clears throat> this woman discovered her husband was having an affair. And the way she dealt with it was to befriend the mistress and teach her how to cook. And she designed these menus uh, that were complementary in a negative sense, so that uh, he eat with the mistress, eat with the wife, and the food interacted to make him very sick. And uh, he could have used these sorts of devices. And <clears throat> as a result, when I got here, I decided to be very careful about what I ate. And so uh, I've tried to go out with the same person every night, let my host do all the ordering to make sure I didn't uh, have a negative interaction. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the role of precision measurement uh, in synthetic biology. And you know, there's a long tradition of precision measurement in physics. And Galileo is sort of patron saint of physics and 300 years ago is the guy who sort of set all this off in motion, um, first by building his telescope and turning up to the heavens, and also uh, in a number of other areas, ranging from mechanics to, uh, to metrology of place, uh, position, and so forth. And he said, measure what's measurable and make measurable what is not so. And these are sort of, uh, I think, guiding principles for synthetic biology now. And I'm going to, that'll be as far into the phys physics shtick as I get in this talk, but uh, uh, I'm going to try to do a little riff on Drew Endy's talk, where he was uh, bringing up uh, sort of similar ideas and saying that you know one needs to have <coughs> sort of some sort of uh, intellectual standardization of the field, and you need to quantify things. And he talks about it in terms of data sheets, uh, and it's sort of an interesting question of what should go into the data sheet. Um, <coughs> and so I'm going to. Uh, argue that you should make them as detailed as possible. And in the first part of the talk, I'm going to describe how you might think about characterizing transcription factors fully uh, and what you might put in their data sheets. Uh, Drew also talked about the need for uh, improving the ability to synthesize DNA. And I agree with that. But I also think after DNA, uh, you need to think about ways to synthesize uh, protein on large scales. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm going to talk about ways we developed my lab to uh, do almost genome scale protein synthesis, so synthesis of many thousands of proteins at the same time and ways to study them. Um, <clears throat> and last, I'll talk about another way to measure, uh, uh, another measurement technique in synthetic biology. In this case, looking, instead of looking at the comp components, looking at the final circuit and ways to measure them uh, carefully using uh, a kind of bioreactor called a chemostat. Okay? Uh, and all of this uh, we've done in my lab using microfluidics, and that's kind of a uh, underlying technology theme to uh, a good part of the group's research. So <clears throat> if you think about gene regulatory networks, okay, people like to represent them uh, very suggestively, just like a computer diagram. Uh, and the difference is, uh, in an in a integrated circuit, uh, you can look at any component in the diagram and ask, what does it do? And you can get a very detailed description of what it does based on its uh, underlying device physics. Whereas in biology, uh, mostly the answer in these cases come back, well, you know there's an interaction there, but not much more. And to uh, really understand these systems and then the design using these pieces, uh, you need to have a lot more information. And so we got interested in trying to develop biophysical methods of measuring that would allow us to do this. And uh, more generally to ask this question of, if you make a careful enough biophysical measurement in vitro on the system, can you predict some real biology um, <clears throat> without having to probe the specific physiology of the organism? And the challenge in doing this uh, is that real biological interactions tend to be weak. They're low affinity. Um, and uh, transcription factors are no exception. You can sort of see that here by looking at the, uh, the half-lives of binding of various interactions. And things you're familiar with, like stratavidin and biotin, very strong interactions. Antibodies, also very strong. But more generally, you get things that bind and, uh, and release in timescales of seconds and fractions of a second. And, uh, that's why uh, it's challenging to do large-scale characterization of transcription factors. And if you put things on a big microarray and let transcription factors bind, they fall off as you're doing the washes. And so it's, it's hard to do any kind of real quantitative measurement on a large scale. So we developed a measurement technology to get around that problem, which we called Mitomi. Uh, it's sort of a mechanical trapping scheme uh, for looking at molecular interactions. And the idea is pretty simple. 
Um, if you can imagine you're in a small microfluidic chamber and the surface has been derivatized to hold down the transcription factor and you've got a bunch of DNA molecules in solution that are fluorescently labeled. They reach some equilibrium between bound and unbound. If you look at the chamber under a microscope, it's all a fluorescent blur. You can't tell what's bound and what's not. This chamber has a, a deflectable rubber membrane in the ceiling. We kind of call it a button. Uh, and so if you deflect the button down and squish it against the surface, you extrude all the solution and all the unbound molecules, and you're squishing down the bound ones against the surface. Uh, and under the microscope, it looks like this. Okay, So the button is pushed down, and you see that disk in the middle. The annulus there around the disk is a place where the button is touching the surface, but there's no transcription factors. So that tells you something about what the nonspecific binding is and the background levels. And then the extruded fluid is on the outside. You can wash away the extruded fluid, and you're just left with what's under the button, which you can interrogate at your leisure. And if this happens to be something with a short half-life, and the transcription factor lets go of the DNA, the DNA doesn't go anywhere because that rubber membrane is holding it against the surface. Okay, So you're able to measure really weak interactions down to binding constants of uh, 20 micromolar. Okay, Now, <clears throat> so it's got sensitivity. It turns out it also has, because it's microfabricated, we can take advantage of the power of lithography. This allows one to make very parallel measurements. And we're now making devices that have thousands of these measurement units on them. Okay, and so we can measure a lot of interactions at the same time, and it becomes reasonable to think about ways to measure the binding energy of a given transcription factor against all possible DNA sequences. So we've done that. Um, <clears throat> we make libraries uh, uh, of uh, ways to explore all possible variations on the binding site. We put each molecule down. Oh, actually, let me explain one more thing. So the way we program the device is with a, a microarray. So we take the DNA molecules and we array them down with a robotic fountain pen on a glass slide. Then we put our rubber device on top and bind to it. And so every unit cell gets to probe a different DNA sequence. Okay? And that's how you get the parallelism here. So uh, we, the way we put them down is at different concentrations for each sequence. And then we can get binding curves out. Um, and we calibrate carefully so that we can get the binding constants and absolute units. So we get a KD out from fitting this. Then we can convert the KD to a free energy of binding using the thermodynamic relation. And uh, this allows us to make lots of measurements uh, without a lot of effort. This work I'm going to describe was done by one student. Um, and uh, he's able to, each of these projects was done in a period of months. Um, and it's a very data rich uh, approach. So we look first at a family of transcription factors called basic helix loop helix. Uh, this is the third largest family of eukaryotic transcription factors. They're involved in all kinds of things, ranging from uh, development, inflammation, cancer, you name it. We looked at uh, a human member, with Max, uh, may be familiar to you, and a couple of yeast members here. And <clears throat> what's plotted here uh, is our first free energy landscapes for these uh, transcription factors. Uh, and what's plotted up is the binding constants on a log scale, so it's like binding energy, uh, against all possible formers. And, uh, these, uh, because of there's uh, an interesting structural symmetry in this family, they're formed by dimers, homodimers. Uh, that effectively gives you access to all possible eightmers of binding sequence. Okay, and you can see that sure enough, they're all in the same family because they all bind the same consensus motif right here. That's the so-called E box, uh, and these other peaks of binding end up having very interesting biophysical interpretations, which I'm not going to dwell on today. Um, so. Uh, this was great as kind of a low resolution pass, but I was actually not happy with it because they all look the same. Uh, and we know that these all have different roles in the cell. They must recognize different sequences. Um, and so we took another pass and expanded uh, the sequence space, looked at the ninth and 10th bases, and were able to actually find uh, significant differences in what these uh, uh, transcription factors bind. And we're able to go beyond the consensus motif for the family and say, what's special and particular about these transcription factors. And so here, for the first time, was FO4 and CBF1 with their, uh, not just their family motif, which is in the middle, but the flanking bases are what makes them specific and special and have different biological function. So with that in hand, uh, we decided to try to predict what they did. Okay, So we've made a bunch of biophysical measurements. Uh, and we know we have informatic knowledge of the genome. And so uh, the equation is pretty simple. Binding energies plus genome sequence gives you a lot of predictions about where these things bind. And for those who uh, are interested in the details, we took all the ORFs and yeast and looked at the regulatory regions in front of them. 
uh, because we measure free energy of binding, uh, we can just use the Boltzmann factor to predict the probability of being bound to any, bound to any spot in that regulatory region. And then as you slide along and calculate all the possible probabilities, you can then multiply them together to find out the probability of occupying a given binding region. This is an algorithm developed by Granick and Clark a little while ago. And so you get a probability for each gene uh, that, the, that the transcription factor is binding to its regulatory region. And then you look at the highest probability genes. And what do you see? Uh, <clears throat> well, it turns out you're able to recapitulate pretty much the entire classical biochemical literature uh, on these transcription factors. Uh, you find that FO4 is involved in things around phosphate metabolism, and CBF1 is involved in methionine biosynthesis and uh, chromosome structure and so forth. And the overlap was negligible. I think there was maybe only two genes uh, that were shared to be in common between these two. So we really were able to resolve uh, their differences in function. And the comparisons with large-scale studies are also interesting. I'm not going to dwell on that now. Um, but the point here is that uh, we were able to do what we set out to, which was to uh, make some predictions about physiology without ever harming a yeast, okay, or without having to probe the specific physiology of the organism. Just enough to know the physics and to know the informatics. Uh, you can uh, say something non-trivial. And sort of the larger point is, you know, is this the sort of thing that you should be doing in, in synthetic biology and have that as part of your data sheet? Um, and I think the answer is yes, because as you see, the ambitions of the field are expanding um, from designing small circuits to designing entire genomes, as we've heard over the course of the conference, you're going to have to think about what it means. And if you want to go beyond doing small perturbations on a genome and do really substantial changes, you're going to have to think about uh, not only uh, making it do what you want, but how to prevent unwanted side effects and binding regulation and so forth. And so this sort of comprehensive characterization, uh, I suspect, will become essential. Um, <clears throat> We got interested in trying to uh, now apply this to the large number of uncharacterized transcription factors in the HLH family. And in the human genome, there's many that have been identified purely on the basis of homology, and you know, nothing is known about their biology. Uh, they all have different uh, amino acid motifs in the binding region, uh, and this is sort of a chart of their various relationships. And the kind of <clears throat> obvious thing would have been to try and repeat this process that we did on yeast on human and do it for all these different ones, but we, uh, that seemed like too much work to me. And so we decided to try something different, and that is to reverse engineer the binding code of the whole family all in one shot. So there's a few crystal structures uh, of members of this family bound to DNA. And if you look carefully, there's four or five positions where uh, residues seem to touch the DNA. And presumably, that's where all the DNA recognition ability comes from. And <clears throat> we decided to try to uh, create every possible point mutant um, of the residues that touch DNA. Okay? And so at each of those five locations, we did every possible point mutation. And that gives us uh, some 100 different uh, mutants, and we went and characterized the DNA binding properties of every single one of them. Um, and so uh, we first tested against just changing the base that was touching, and then we tested against changing all the nearest neighbors as well. Um, and I'll make a sort of a long story short, and it all gets sort of summarized right here, is that, uh, in fact, uh, you have very limited ability to dial in an arbitrary binding sequence for this family. It's incredibly highly constrained by evolution. And so these are the five positions right here that we changed. Uh, and along the x-axis, you have all the amino acids. Uh, and then what is plotted in the different colors are binding against uh, different motifs where we've changed just the, the, the nucleotide it touches in this case. And so for this one, uh, it only binds to the wild type nucleotide and nothing else. We can, we can reduce the binding affinity a little bit, but we can't uh, substitute for anything. On these two, we can destroy the binding affinity, but we can't dial in another nucleotide there. Uh, and on these two, we have more on this one than on this one. We have some limited ability to put in a substitute base, uh, but it's uh, those are the only positions where we can do that. And, and this one, I think we'd only put one in, and these we could put three. So uh, it's, e evolution has, has, is really limited here, and that is perhaps uh, why in this family it's taken to this uh, strategy of creating dimers. Because these things can not only homodimerize, they can heterodimerize, and that's uh, the route to generating uh, diversity of recognition in this family. Okay, now <clears throat> let me say a few words about the technical approach here. Um, we did all the manipulation uh, here uh, using in vitro tricks. So all those mutants were generated using PCR tricks. We didn't do any cloning. Um, and uh, we also 
generated all the proteins in vitro as well by using cell lysase. And so, you know, sort of our philosophy is that the cell should be the object of study and not the tool you use. Um, and you want to learn something about the way the cell works, but it's kind of 20th century technology to be cloning and expressing in, in the organism itself. Um, and it, uh, it's allowed us to do things very quickly and efficiently, and I work with a pretty small group, and uh, uh, it's sort of an illustration, I think, of the power of these measurement techniques that, that, you, can, uh, that, that you can get things done. Um, now, this in vitro protein synthesis is something that's been around for a while, but it's, it's not as widely used as I think it should be. I've been walking around the posters and noticing people are picking it up here in this field, and I think it's great. One of the traditional challenges is that it, uh, it gives low yields um, and it's expensive to do. Uh, both of those are answered with microfluidic tools because we don't need much to make the measurement. Uh, and uh, so you use less reagent, and by taking advantage, as I'll show you in the next few slides, of sort of some of the parallel plumbing aspects of microfluidics, you uh, can really do much more with less. So I don't know about that buzzing sound. Should we, uh, I have a mobile phone. Is it a mobile phone detector? Uh, I do have a new email. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what, I'll switch off my Wi-Fi too. Whoops. All right, now my Wi-Fi is off. I'm disconnected from the world. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to give you a couple of examples now of how we're trying to take this in the protein space. Um, so uh, we got interested in measuring protein-protein interactions, uh, sort of from a basic science point of view. Um, but uh, as I sort of said in the beginning, I, I think that uh, these will also become important ways to characterize uh, your tools and parts uh, in synthetic biology, because you want to know if there's going to be unwanted interactions. It turns out that uh, many proteins moonlight which is to say, beyond their nominal annotated function, they interact with other pathways and, and in other roles. And uh, you could, when you're designing a system, find that it's not working because you're getting unexpected binding and so forth. And you know, one of the examples to think about this is glutamate racemase. And TB turns out to, besides its enzymatic function, also functions as a DNA gyrase inhibitor. And there's many, many examples of this that people are finding. And so one needs to understand uh, what things are going to stick to each other at the protein level uh, as you design systems. Now, there are ways to do this, and yeast 2 hybrid is probably the most famous and the one that people have tried to, uh, uh, to use on large-scale studies, but uh, the challenge there is it doesn't work very well, is sort of the bottom line. It's, it's not meant for high-throughput approaches. It doesn't have great sensitivity, and you can see that by looking uh, at the literature. The overlap between large-scale yeast 2 hybrids uh, done by independent groups <laughs> ends up being a couple of percent the number of interactions they find in common on the same organism. That's not very good. They also are finding only about 5% of the expected number of interactions. So there's a need for a new measurement technology in the area. And uh, we've tried to use the chip I just described with mechanical trapping to do this to look at protein-protein interactions as well as the protein DNA I described. So uh, we chose Streptococcus pneumoniae as our model organism. Uh, it's uh, important from the medical point of view in that it it's uh, the cause of a number of antibiotic-resistant infections in hospitals. Uh, we've got most of the ORFs sitting in our fridge now from Tiger. And when we went to SwissProt and looked at what is the entire sort of world's knowledge of protein interactions in, in this organism, uh, there's only 45. Uh, and so this has sort of been an organism that is, uh, because it's not a model organism, it's sort of been understudied. And so we decided to take all those proteins involved in those interactions, those 45 proteins, and we would remeasure everything, all in one shot, and we do an all against all, okay, while we were at it. Uh, so instead of just doing the specific interactions, we did all possible combinations. Um, and the way we did this uh, is using in vitro protein synthesis and the, the uh, mechanical trapping chip I just described. So we make a microarray, not of the proteins, but of the genes, the expression vectors. And they're prepared, again, by in vitro PCR tricks. We uh, do double spotting, so we spot down both the bait and the prey, which is the interaction you want to probe, on a single spot. And then this is the unit cell of the chip right here. The chip goes down on top. This is where the button is. and the, uh, So the chip is placed on top of the DNA array. We fill the whole thing with, uh, with lysate, and the proteins are synthesized, and they diffuse in uh, under the button. And then we label them uh, using antibodies. And uh, one is pulled down to the surface, and the others are labeled fluorescence. And we look under the button to see if there's binding or not. Okay? And so in this way, we can synthesize thousands of protein in parallel using a tiny amount of lysate. 
and probe their interactions. And as you can imagine, this is a very general approach. You can, uh, by designing the plumbing appropriately, do more than just measure interactions and ask pretty much any questions you want about having many, with many different proteins in hand. We uh, got pretty good expression. Uh, I think everything expressed. Uh, and the expression levels varied about a factor of two uh, around the median. Uh, and uh, it was more or less independent of protein size as well. So that was pretty good. Uh, and this is sort of our first interaction map uh, with this set, uh, where we plotted uh, expression levels of prey and bait on these axes, and then the strength of the interaction as measured by the fluorescence uh, on this axis. Okay? Uh, and it's been color coded in such a way that these gold ones here are ones that fall below our threshold for interaction. Uh, these sort of green ones are ones that fell below the threshold for interaction but actually were annotated. So we have sort of a false negative rate that's determined by that. The red ones here are the ones that were annotated and ones that we call as interactions, and we did pretty well. Uh, and the blue ones are new interactions uh, that weren't annotated or known, okay? Putative new ones. We went back and uh, did a bunch of spot checking. We didn't check all of them, but we chose a, a sort of a random sample and uh, checked them with macro scale, microliter scale, immunoprecipitation experiments on the bench. Every one we checked was verified. Um, so you know, we believe these are all real interactions, and it's actually a, there's a very dense network of interactions among this group. And how dense? Uh, this is uh, the set right here of, uh, of, of previously known annotated ones from SwissProt. These are the ones we discovered, uh, and uh, you can see the overlap here. Uh, our false negative rate is about 30% uh, there. And <clears throat> this other circle here are what the homologs do in E. coli. There's a much larger experimental data set on E. coli, uh, including E2 hybrid studies, and you can see that the agreement is actually uh, pretty slim. Interesting to know whether that's something real based on biology or something to do with measurement. We're going to try to sort that out uh, in the coming year. And this is what the network looks like, OK? All right, uh, just as kind of a side note, um, <clears throat> We've also used this approach to look at membrane proteins. And in fact, uh, in collaboration with Jeff Glenn at Stanford, uh, we're able to identify a new drug target, hepatitis C, uh, and do a screen of small molecules against that interaction. So in this case, we made a microarray of, of small molecules from a library that we purchased commercially and tested to see which of these would inhibit the interaction of this membrane protein against the HCV genome. And we found uh, 18 compounds that did that in vitro. Uh, six of them worked in vivo in a, quote, in vivo, in a cell-based, cell-line-based uh, HCV replicon. And uh, the best one uh, turns out to be an already approved drug. It's an old antihistamine that uh, 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 is from the first half of the 20th century. And so uh, this is sort of an illustration that this approach of measuring affinities can also be used uh, in drug discovery and uh, with membrane proteins, which is an important class that you can't test in yeast to hybrid. Now, the last, in the last couple of minutes here, I'm going to talk about uh, trying to make measurements uh, of fairly complex things, not just parts, but circuits. Uh, and <clears throat> we got interested in doing this a number of years ago uh, as part of a DARPA program with Francis Arnold and Ron Weiss and a few others, um, and decided that chemostats uh, would be a very powerful way to, to study uh, circuits. Um, you know, people would tend to just do them in batch culture. You throw them into uh, a flask, let things grow over time, and look at what the circuit's doing. And the problems with that are the boundary conditions are not held constant. It's, it's not a very well-controlled measurement because uh, your cell density is changing as the, as the bugs grow up. Uh, they're consuming uh, the food in there, and they're creating waste products. And so a lot of things are changing. And you know, these might cause problems with the circuit. And it certainly means that you don't have a well-defined measurement. Whereas chemostats, which have been around since the 50s, are a pretty much ideal tool for measuring these things because they keep all the boundary conditions constant. Okay, the food, the waste, the cell concentration, all that uh, is is maintained at a constant level, uh, and and so it's it's a more controlled way to do it. The problem is chemostats are hard to use, um, and so we designed a microfluidic version uh, with six parallel chemostats that sat on automated microscopes, so you can take pictures in every one, and we put into it uh, a circuit that uh, Francis and Ron had designed. Uh, which was a population control circuit. So these bugs would talk to each other uh, through a quorum sensing molecule. And if their concentration got too high, they'd start to kill themselves. And you know, what they found in batch culture was that when the circuit was off, 
they would grow to a certain level, circuit was on, there'd be a little wiggle, and they'd grow to a lower level. And you notice it stopped about 60 hours. So uh, we decided to put this circuit in the chemostat for a few different reasons, uh, one of which was to make a more careful measurement. The other was, which was to try to observe it for a longer period. You know, at, Another general property of systems biology is as you make more and more complicated circuits and try and stick these things into, into bugs, there's very little evolutionary advantage to keeping them there, so the bugs tend to kick them out. And in fact, uh, these circuits tended to uh, uh, mutate and fail after about 60 hours. And uh, so one way to address this is to slow down evolution, and you can do that by shrinking the volume of your bioreactor. Okay? So the smaller number of cells are there, the less likely uh, the longer you have to wait for a mutation to come to, to take over the population, it expands the, the window in which you can observe the circuit. And so sure enough, um, uh, not only did that happen, this graph shows an experiment going on to 200 hours. Uh, we've had some go out to 500, uh, so we're increasing by a factor of, uh, of almost an order of magnitude, the observation time. You'll see what happened when we turn the circuit on here. Uh, we saw some really interesting behavior. It, in fact, oscillated uh, before settling down to a lower population level. These are the circuit off circuit on on these. And so these oscillations really weren't apparent uh, from the batch culture measurements. Again, you know, it's, it's hard to get up data points and hard to do it. The precision of the measurement let us describe kind of an interesting effect. And oscillators aren't trivial to make. This was one that was discovered serendipitously. The other amusing thing was that uh, because we're taking video images of the chip all the way through, we were able to observe that uh, the morphology of the cells of uh, the bacteria changed dramatically uh, through each phase of the oscillation. So as the population kind of went up and down, you went through this cycle of, uh, of healthy-looking bugs to sick, elongated ones, back to healthy ones. And this would repeat over and over again through each oscillation. And finally, uh, I just also wanted to point out that you can combine the chemostat with the in vitro protein synthesis. Uh, this was something actually an undergrad student, Elaine G, did in my lab almost five years ago. Uh, and we never got around to publishing it, but it's sort of amusing, and maybe the, its time has come. Uh, so she used the chemostat and, uh, and put the in vitro lysates in, looked at GFP expression, and sure enough, you could uh, create uh, steady state situations, and the steady state level depended on the amount of uh, uh, the temperature in this case and the amount of DNA template in this one. So in the chemostat, you're constantly pumping out the product uh, and the template and supplying a new template, and so uh, it ends up synthesizing enough uh, fluorescence to keep up with the uh, stuff you're taking out every round. You can also run it as a turbidistat, which means you use feedback to set the output level. And these graphs, the, the desired set point is shown in red, and the actual level is shown in black. And you can see that you know, we set the set point up here, and we're able to more or less tailing off a little bit. We're able to more or less keep it. Here she set it at three different levels, and you can see that it tracks exactly along. OK, so I think. I'll just wrap up there and say that uh, almost all the chips that we use here are made in our little microfluidic foundry at Stanford. It's a, uh, it's a shared facility we run on campus. We teach a course there for Stanford students during the year in a summer school every summer. If you're interested in uh, learning how to do it, just drop us a note. Uh, we also uh, have professional staff who will make chips for people there. We make a couple thousand chips a year. About half of them are used by my group, and the other half are sent uh, around the world. Uh, there's a lot of information about that on our webpage. And these are some of the folks who've done the work. So Sebastian Merkel designed the Matomi device and did the work with transcription factors. Here he is showing the power of microfluidic automation, where the chip is doing the experiment while he sits there playing his guitar all day right outside of my office, which is right here. Um, and uh, the work with protein-protein interactions and HCV was done by Duran Gerber. The HCV stuff was done in collaboration with Jeff Glenn and his postdoc, Sharid Ainav. Uh, the chemostat was done by Frederick Balagad. Uh, the cell-based chemostat by Frederick Balagan and the in vitro one by Elaine G. I'll stop here and take any questions. I think we have time for a couple of questions. It's a really fantastic talk. Uh, really impressive with the protein interaction screen. Could you just um, expand a little bit more? Because obviously you're expressing these proteins in vitro. Yeah. And the obvious, you know, um, sort of biological view might be that they're not properly folding mm. or they're, you know, they're not properly, well, it wouldn't necessarily be modified in bacteria, but if you moved out to eukaryotic systems, they might not be properly modified. And a lot of, you know, biological interactions are potentially transient through through those kind of phosphorylation and all the rest of it. If you could just sort of comment on that. Be yeah, sure. So, you know, that's a very well taken point. And, you know, we're talking about bacterial system right here, and we use E. coli lysates for this. 
But you also have uh, mammalian lysates from E. coli, or sorry, from yeast, uh, wheat germ and rabbit reticulocyte, and presumably those will have the uh, cofactors that help with chaperones and post-translational modifications. And so I think that's probably a good route towards uh, uh, mammalian proteins. Um, and I think you can uh, sort of, if you're clever, design in specific post-translational modifications if there's things you know that you want to go after. Um, but uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, great talk. With the um, protein DNA interactions where you were scanning for binding to different sequences and there, there was very little diversity there, but you were, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looked like you were sampling single point changes in the amino acid with single codon base changes in the in the binding sequence. Yeah, so when we were trying to reverse engineer the binding yeah. code. Yes, yeah. that's right. We only mutated the parts that looked like they were touching the DNA. Yeah, but I, I just wondered... It, do you think you would get greater diversity in new binding sequences if you incorporated multiple DNA changes yeah. with multiple amino acid changes? Uh, it's a, a much good, bigger sequence space. It's obviously. a good question. So you're sort of asking: Is the uh, are these uh, the points of touching independent from each other, or are they dependent in some way? And you know, I think the only way we're going to find out is if we do it. Um, uh, you know, it's also possible that things that don't touch the DNA matter. I mean, maybe that that uh, helix completely refolds according to parts that don't touch it, and that may add some diversity. And was we're going to try and sort through that. Were you forward. mutating the, the, the second helix that binds the phosphate backbone, or mm -hmm. just the one that intercalates into the groove? So, you know, I'm going to put the structure up again. All right, so it's oh, okay, helix, okay. loop it's not, helix, yeah. and the second helix part is the one that touches the DNA, and, and these are the specific... Uh, and it was just touching on the, on the DNA. Okay. Are there any phosphate interactions in the loop? Uh, good question. I don't know the answer. Because I think in terms of the modulation of the DNA backbone yeah. with sequence, phosphate interactions are, are key. And that, uh, I think, might be intrinsic in terms mm -hmm. of changing binding specificity. Thank you. Okay, because the interest is high, I think we have to move on to the next speaker. Please join me to the next speaker again. Thank you.